Welcome to You Don't Know Ball. Today, we're going to be predicting the over and under win totals for all 32 NFL teams. We are doing this based off the draft Kings win total. So we're going to go division by division. As always, we will start in the AFC East. So as always, if you don't know ball and want to know ball, be sure to subscribe, leave a like, let us know in the comments who you think is going to completely shatter their win total this year. Starting off Dobbs with the Buffalo Bills, I also have a strength of schedule meter here. Uh, you can see the key at the bottom. So the strength of schedule, I should probably explain this, is based off of the wins or the record last year. Right, So that's how this is calculated, based off the teams on their schedule from the last year. Um, as you can guys can see on the right of the video, I have the schedule grid, so you'll be able to see their, the team's schedule and who they're playing every single week. So with that being said, Buffalo Bills over or under 10.5 wins with their strength of schedule being pretty hard. Dobbs, what are you taking? Dude, this is one of the ones I literally knew we were going to talk about this one right off the bat. And I even had time to think about it before we started recording. And I haven't come to a consensus. Like, Bills fans, let me be clear. If I have to pull the under on this one, just understand. I do I do believe that they could definitely be a team where, yes, even though I think I'm leaning the under on this one, but not by a lot. It's just that I feel like the Bills, ah, it's tough, though. You know, you know what? I, I'm changing my viewpoint. I'm changing my viewpoint. Some way, somehow. I actually lean towards Josh Allen still finding a way to get over that 10 win hump. I think that they could, you know, again, it's very 50 50. They could very much be a 10 and under team. They could very much be 11. I'm going to lean the 11 side. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to take the over on that. So the bills have not had under 11 wins since 2019. So you said you took the over. Yeah. I'm rocking over on this one after some dispute. Yeah. So I guess my thing is, I I think they can be a 10-win team. I just don't – I'm not necessarily confident that with the way they played last year, kind of the retooling of the roster, I guess you want to call it, losing Josh Allen's number one receiver. I don't know if Keon is going to be necessarily an instant impact type of player. I can definitely see them as more of a – 10 win team i think they'll still be a playoff team i think it's going to be pretty rough in the afc honestly but at the end of the day i just have a hard time believing that a team that won 11 games last year is somehow going to win 11 this year when they lost their number one receiver and they did lose kind of a little bit on defense as well and you know you did supplement issues through the draft but I, I just think this is going to be one of those off years for the Buffalo Bills. So I'm going to go ahead and go under. See, that's how I was initially feeling. I don't know, dude. A little birdie just came and told me that. I, I just, at last second, I just, I had a, I don't know, dude. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm, Josh Allen's going to rock out a crazy season. I'm going to stick with my gut on this one. But I was with you. I'm, in, I'm with you on the initial thoughts. Like, I totally get it. So looking um, at the Buffalo Bills, right? Like, they have and their schedule they have new england week 16 and 18 so nice to finish the season but week 17 they play the jets week 15 they play the lions week 14 they play the rams week 13 they play san francisco week 11 they play kc the only wins that are i you know it's any given sunday that i see are new england may seattle tennessee Arizona like all those are the only games that I have them down as for sure wins and that's not how I felt last year so we'll do a game we'll do a video where we pick all throughout the schedule but just going strictly off over under numbers that schedule just kind of scares me especially with the late um late season opponents yeah you know when you know, when you lay it out like that that is scary but I'm just gonna you know Josh Allen fantastic year last year I'm on the side more like yeah losing Stefan in the end, you look at it initially, you're like, yeah, it's going to hurt. And it, it will. But like, there's also that chance, like, like we've been saying for years, you know, maybe just getting Stefan out of the building, you know, a little bit of a rejuvenation. Everyone has a little bit looser, you know, just maybe, just maybe that's the way this, this, you know, the cards fall. Moving into the Miami Dolphins, they have an easier strength of schedule at four, eight, eight. They open up the season with Jacksonville and then they play Buffalo. But then after that, they have Seattle, Tennessee, New England, Indiana, Arizona. 
So they start off the season pretty light in terms of opponents. And then on the back end, they have Las Vegas, New England, and then it gets a little bit rough. So with that being said, I have been kind of really high on the Dolphins these last couple years. But this year, I I just I feel like there's a lot of pressure on Tua, and if they're not able to get the extension done before the year, I mean Dobbs, do you think they're getting the extension done before the season? Ah, uh, I just I feel like the way it's trending, like I'm with you. It's just like I don't know. I do think that that's probably like what they're aiming towards. But like I told Dolphins fans, it's it's, it's and I said this before. I'll say it again. You know, it's it's a weird situation because you get this deal done with Tua. And realistically, a lot of that core that they've come to love over these next few seasons is going to inevitably have to find their way out of the door. Tua is going to demand such a big chunk of that cap, as we know. I don't know, though. And that's, but I was going to say, you know, to the point, that was why with my reasoning, without, you know, I'll spoil a little. I think I'm leaning towards over knowing that if they don't get that deal d- done before the season, he's fighting for his contract. But then also, if they don't, just maybe do they? I, you know, I don't know. It's like that, them getting that contract done kind of affects how I view the, this over under. Because like if you get it done, just maybe, you know, a little bit of complacency. We know how guys are. Again, I don't yeah. want to put that onto it. But sometimes after guys get paid, you see the foot off the gas. And it's like, I don't know. Could that be Tua? I don't know. I don't work with Tua. I don't see his work happen. <laughs> I don't know. Again, that's why, you know, everyone in the comments always wants to attack you when you say something like this. But that's the, the point is I'm saying I don't know. What I do know is that getting that contract done could or could not have an effect on the Dolphins season. And it's going to have to come down to that. That's the way I see it. So you have the over then? I'm, I'm going to lean over just on the assumption that, yes, it's not done yet. And if it does leak into the season and he's fighting for his Dolphins career and all that money, I see no way that they're not going to, you know, I feel like they could push over 10 wins. But if they get it done... And, you know, he's a little sore. He's got to sit out. He's got to miss some time. It's also very possible then they also go under. So I think, yeah, I'm going to go over right now just on the assumption that that they get, you know, that they don't get something done before the season starts and he's playing for the contract, basically. So I'm going to go under, and this is my reason why. I've gone under on two AFC East teams. The Dolphins, in my opinion, have zero incentive to get the Tua deal done right now. Okay, if you get it done right now, you're going to pay him like a top 10 quarterback. We've seen that sometimes he cannot be that. And the Dolphins know that Mike McDaniel is probably the best offensive coordinator in the league for a quarterback like Tua Tagovailoa. They didn't really address outside of Aaron Brewer, the interior of the offensive line. And my concern is this. You pay it to a, he underperforms, you're stuck with it in a situation. I don't want to say similar to Daniel Jones, where you just knew you shouldn't have given him the contract, but almost in a situation where it's like, eh, we were kind of shaky. And in my opinion, if you're going to pay a guy like he's top 10, you got to know that he's your quarterback. You shouldn't be questioning if you should pay him or not. So let's say they don't pay to a, he plays his last year out and he doesn't perform. What team is going to pay him a ton of money? He could just come back to the Dolphins on a cheaper deal. And I think Tua knows that if he wants to be the best player he can be, he's going to be right here in Miami with the weapons he has, with the coach he has. I think Miami has all the leverage here. I think Tua has to really prove himself this year, but I am just not confident in Tua this year getting it done. So I'm going to go probably similar to the Bills where I have, they're probably going to win 10 games. Dolphins will probably win nine. Okay. See, I'm higher on them than that, but I completely understand what you're saying. I completely understand the viewpoint. Moving over to the New England Patriots, they have an over and under of four and a half with a strength of schedule of 0.512. Honestly, kind of brutal. They open up with Cincinnati, Seattle, who's a decent team, New York Jets, San Francisco, Miami, Houston, Jacksonville Jets again. And then they get a little bit easier with Tennessee, but Tennessee's not a pushover at all. Chicago, Rams, Miami, Indianapolis, Arizona, who I think Arizona is better. Buffalo, Chargers, Buffalo. What an intense schedule for a team that we know is very barren of talent and has a whole new coaching staff. With that being said, I don't see how they win five games this year, and I'm going to go under, especially because the fact of if they play Drake May, they're definitely not winning five games. I love Drake May, but he needs to sit for a year. I feel like I'm in a situation where I'm looking at this, like like all your points, yeah, you're spot on, and I'll even add this. 
realistically, and the Patriots know this. Like in the back of their heads, they know this, right? It's like obviously the coaches and the players are not, I'm not, they're not going for this. But the way that it is right now, look, if you lose as many, not as many as pop, you get what I'm saying though, you lose, you lose a lot of games. It's not a bad thing. You have a lot of roster construction to be done. It's, it is far from a, a tragedy if this roster does not win five games. So they're not expected to. They don't have really the talent necessarily with that schedule, in my opinion. And to your point, like you're saying, I don't think they have the talent even to do it right now. For me, this is an easy one where, again, no disrespect, Patriots fans. I just I just don't really see you guys getting it done. And I think if you guys were to get to five wins this year, it would actually be an accomplishment with this roster right now because there is just so much to be done in terms of building. So, yeah, I'm going to go under on this one. Even though it's a disrespectful line, Patriots fans, if you guys go under again and you guys get more high draft capital, it's a good thing all in all. Just remember that. I promise you, because if you think about it this way, Dobbs, if they sit Drake May until like week 16, right? Get him in their last couple games. Let's say New England gets the number one pick, right? We know the draft class next year isn't that highly touted in terms of quarterback, but let's say there's a team that wants to trade up for one. You already got your guy. Trade back, get a ton of assets, get a player. You're able to build around May, and maybe that was their plan all along. They know they're stuck with a tough schedule. They know that the team is not ready to compete now. Get your quarterback because you don't like the ones next year, and then try to get the number one pick again and trade out and collect assets. I think that would be a good compromise between, you know, Elliot Wolf and Robert Kraft. I, I think Robert Kraft is definitely wanting to win more now, where Elliot Wolf wants to um, kind of rest and develop May. I don't know the whole plans. That would be my guess behind the scenes. So I don't know. I just feel like that would be the best course of action right now for the New England Patriots. No, and again, I think that's I'm, I'm exactly there with you. Like the reality is, winning this year, there's just nothing to necessarily gain from it. Like it, it's just losing in, is the best thing in the long term. And real Patriots fans know that at this point, it, you got to build. You know, you got to tear down to build up. So they're just in that situation this year. Next, we have the New York Jets over under nine and a half wins with the strength of schedule in the middle at a point five zero five. Last year, they went seven and ten. And when we're looking at the Jets, you know, they play San Fran week one, but then they get Tennessee, New England, Denver, Minnesota, depending on how you feel about them and their quarterback situation. Then it gets a little bit tougher. You get Buffalo, Pitt, but then you get New England again. Houston, and then you get Arizona, Indy. So it's right in the middle. And my opinion is if you're winning seven games with such a putrid offense last year and you upgrade your team this year, you upgrade the offensive line, give me the over on the Jets at nine and a half. Yeah, I was going to say for this one, look, and let me be crystal clear with this because I can already hear the comments on this one. Like, yes, if something happens to Aaron Rodgers or something happens to that O-line in total and a bunch of them, you know, go down. Look, this is one where it could very quickly go super south. But we're under the the assumption, obviously, that Aaron Rodgers is going to be healthy the whole year, that O-line is going to stay upright. If they can do that, yeah, I think realistically, we're looking at a team that should, at the bare minimum, win 10 games. So I think the Jets actually got a pretty favorable line right here. Yeah, I mean, I think, in my opinion, they have the best chance to win the AFC East. And I think the line is actually lower than what the Bills are. One, because Josh Allen's younger, but also the injury history is kind of scary. And maybe Nathaniel Hackett is still employed by the organization. Yeah, that you know what? <laughs> is, this, is this the Nathaniel Hackett tax that this we're is, witnessing live? The, Vegas is accounting for Nathaniel Hackett when they set lines. Um, but with Rodgers playing quarterback, they should be okay. Moving in to the NFC East, we have the Dallas Cowboys at 10 and a half. They also have a .505 strength of schedule. Looking at Dallas, you know, they open up with Cleveland, not the best opponent, especially if Deshaun Watson just comes back average. Then they play New Orleans, Baltimore, the Giants, Pittsburgh, Detroit, San Fran, Atlanta, Philly, Houston, um, and then you get a little bit easier with Washington, the Giants, Carolina, and Cincinnati's a tough opponent. Then you get Tampa Bay, Philly, Washington. I will say this schedule is harder than the strength of schedule makes it seem. I think when you play a team like Pittsburgh, when you play a team like um, Atlanta, I just don't think those teams are accounted for in how scrappy they are. Yes, their record, I don't think, tells the whole story. 11 games is tough. 
I think, Dobbs. So uh, how are you feeling about this? Are you going over or under? Well, I think, too, it's also like, they, you know, those division games are always really scrappy. They, they're bound to split one with at least one of the, if, you know, the teams that are not the Eagles, the way I see it very likely. I think I'm going to lean under on this one. But again, Cowboys fans, let me be clear. This is one where you guys could totally end up smashing this. And yes, again, it's all just predictions. But I think I'm going to go into the assumption where they're going to be. I can see them being like realistically, I expect them to be about a 10 win team at the end of the year. And yeah, still a playoff team. But I think I would expect about nine, 10 wins right around that. Not really much lower or higher. But again, they could they could definitely, definitely be a 11, 12 win team and, and shatter that. So that's one of the ones where you're not super confident in it. But just with the lack of offseason moves, the turnover, I feel like. And yet to your point, it is it's a pretty tough schedule. I'm going to go under on this one. So this is why it's tough, because the Cowboys have won 12 games the last three years. And they've lost a lot, and they got to pay Micah, they got to play Dak, they got to pay CD. I think the pressure is really on McCarthy, but it's almost to the point where there's so much pressure on this guy, you don't really supplement in the free agency. The draft, yeah, you had an okay draft, but you're really banking on Tyler Guyton panning out. He's a very raw prospect. Yeah, very boomer bust draft, to your point. So... I think especially when you look at the schedule, okay, let's say, let's say, God forbid, CD Lamb goes down. Brandon Cooks is now your number one receiver and Jalen Tolbert's your number two. So I just, I'm sorry, I have to go under here. I just, I don't, I think they can win 10 games, but I just don't see them being a team that is going to win 11 games when you had far more talent on the roster the last couple years and won 12. Well, and also, like, we haven't even necessarily discussed it yet either, but real quick, just to throw it in, and, you know, everyone already knows, but look, when you lose Dan Quinn and you're under a new defensive, you know, coordinator, yeah, and everyone has to point. learn new lingo, everyone has to learn new things, it's not an easy turnover. Like, that on top of all the regression, not, I don't want to say there was tons of regression, but you get know what I'm saying. Like you said, yeah, they lost guys that they didn't replace. And that on top of having to learn a bunch of new things, I don't know. It just seems like recipe to be, a, like we're saying, about a 9-10 win team. And Cowboys fans... If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm just going with my gut. You know what I mean? I, I can only go with what I know. Like, All right. We're looking here at the New York Giants over under six and a half with one of the harder strengths of schedules. Uh, not the hardest, but in the hard category, we got .516. If we're going to look at their schedule, they open up at Minnesota, Washington. So, you know, not the hardest teams. But then they play Cleveland, Dallas, Seattle, Cincinnati, Philly, Pittsburgh, then they get Washington and Carolina, a bye. Tampa Bay, Dallas, New Orleans, Baltimore, Atlanta, Indy, Philly. I'm going to go ahead and take the under. And, you know, I was watching, um, I saw this clip today, and it was it really intrigued me. It was uh, the Greenlight podcast with um, Chris Long. And he was saying, you know, is it possible that the Giants – are kind of holding over like maybe Daniel Jones plays this year, right? Okay. You know, he's not the quarterback of the future. Who becomes available? He, he was basically saying who becomes available next year as a head coach, Bill Belichick. I don't think they're going to move on from Dable, but it's an interesting point. And when we talk about the Giants and have talked about the Giants these last couple years, it's just like, oh, brother, give me a break. It's the same fucking shit every year, every year with them. So I'm going to have to go under. I just don't see a way they win seven games with that uh, schedule. Yeah, well, you remember last year around this time, Giants fans were on our head when we were hammering that under. I think they'll be a little bit more understanding this time. But let me be clear. You know what? This is one of those times where you guys, their defensive line has so many just good names. You guys have a lot of talent on that D-line, right? Even though it's not a complete D-line. If you if the Giants are going to win games, it's going to come off the strength of that D-line the way I see it at this point. But again, for them to get seven off the strength of that D-line, I just don't see it. I see it being, uh, you know, but again, with, with Dable and how they've shown that they can get crafty and just kind of find ways to pull these games out, they're just these slug fests. Let me be clear. It's totally possible they find a way to win seven or eight, but I don't think it's any higher than that. And I'm going to bank on just pure statistics that it'll be lower than that because that's just the way I see it. 
So Giants fans, I'm sorry. I got to hammer another year of the under for you guys. So Dobbs, interesting enough, they won nine games in 2022, you know, and they made the playoffs, finishing third in their division. They lost in the divisional. Before 2022, the last time they won seven games or more was in 2016. So they have only had one season since 2016 where they have finished above 500. Us picking under is not out of the realm of – it's it's not crazy, it, especially with the additions they've made and the situation they have a quarterback. Yeah, like Giants fans, you know, like I know how it is with the New York sports. Like I know how it is. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, they're never going to take it easy. But that, I respect it. I respect that you guys are that passionate, Giants fans. I, you know, I do, I do. But the reality situation is, like I said before, we can only work with what we know. And what we know is that right now the Giants roster is very lackluster in a lot of areas. So, Moving over to the Philadelphia Eagles, 10 and a half wins is the over and under with a strength of schedule of 4-9-1. Taking a look at Philly's schedule, they open up against Green Bay and then Atlanta, New Orleans, Tampa Bay by Cleveland, Giants, Cincinnati, Jacksonville, Dallas, Washington, Rams, Ravens, Panthers, Steelers, Washington, Dallas, Giants. So I think they improved in terms of coaches this year, offensive and defensive coordinator. I think they addressed their defense um, and fixed some of the issues that they were having last year. I think this is one of the easiest overs looking at the schedule, strength of schedule, additions, coaching. So I'm going to go over for the Eagles, Dobbs. Yeah, oh, I'm not even kidding when I tell you this. I'm literally going to hammer this on a- actual DraftKings right when we get off this. <laughs> like, I like this th- before this changes. Because, again, like there was just so much turmoil last year with the Eagles, and they still found a way to be a playoff team. And it's like, yes, they started the season hot. And if it was, if things were how they were the second half of the season, the whole season it wouldn't be the same way. But the bottom line is there's just too much talent on this roster, in my opinion, for them not to find a way to squeak out 11 games. And if Nick Sirianni can just get back to the Nick Sirianni of 2022, 2023, I mean, yeah, it, it just there needs to be less drama around this team, and they are going to be just fine. Eagles fans know that. Yeah, easiest over of the day so far. Moving into the Washington Commanders' last team of the NFC East, we have an over/under of six and a half wins. They open it up. Ooh, I just slurred real bad. They open up against Tampa Bay, the Giants, Cincinnati, Arizona, Cleveland, Baltimore, Carolina, Chicago. Giants again, Pittsburgh, Philly, Dallas, Tennessee, New Orleans, Philly, Atlanta, Dallas. Now, this is a pretty tough schedule. Tampa Bay, not pushovers. They place they're basic they're playing the AFC North as well. So the easy the wins I see coming from them are two against the Giants, possibly. You can maybe get one against Arizona. Carolina, yeah. I think they're a much better team than Carolina. Tennessee, maybe. New Orleans, maybe. But you know what? I'm going to say this. Even looking at the schedule, I think, obviously, any given Sunday, they can win a game. I think the pedigree of Dan Quinn is different. I think they raised the floor of the roster in the free agency class that they brought in. And I think Jaden Daniels is good for a couple explosive games with his legs. And if he can find a way to get moving with his arm as well, I can see them being a seven win team. So give me the over for the commanders, even though this one is kind of a weird one. And I really don't know how to feel. See, I'm going to counter you here. I'm going to go under on this one, just because again, like if Jaden Daniels can lead this team to six wins this if you're a Commanders fan with the way that this roster is constructed right now, I actually think you should feel really good about it. I don't, but I don't see him pushing. I just don't see this roster pushing over six. Like, I think if you can get to even five or six this year, feel good about it. Because again, there still is a lot of work to be done on this roster. There are so many holes in a lot of position groups and, and more than anything, just a lot of age at certain position groups. Like the, the reality is just, there still is a lot that needs to be tooled in with this roster, right? But, you know, to your point, I do think Jane Daniels is going to have a better rookie season than a lot of people think. I think Jane Daniels is going to have a couple explosive games. I just don't think, again, even with just there, there's still so much to be done on defense, the pass rush on this team is going to be so minimal. I just feel like I just don't see them getting over, over basically to get seven. I can see them getting to six all day. I just don't see them getting to seven. So here's another reason I have them going to seven, because they won four games last year. Obviously, they sold at the deadline. 
Um, but in 2022, they had eight wins. 21, they had seven wins. 2020, they had seven wins. Then 2019, they had three wins. But from 2018 to 2015, they all had seven to nine wins. So this is a team that has hung around the seven win mark for quite a while, seven to, seven to eight, seven to nine. And I just feel with the veteran leadership of a Bobby Wagner and adding like a guy like Austin Eckler, regardless if you feel he's got juice left or not, um, I just think the floor for this team is a lot higher than it was last year because of coaching and the players they brought in. But I could also very well see them not hitting that seven mark. Like this is, I'm not going to lie, Dobbs, this is one of the ones that I feel kind of weird about. No, no, it definitely is because again, like like I'm saying, and I, you know, and I could be totally wrong. Like Jane Daniels could come in and have an amazing rookie year, and all of a sudden, they definitely could be a seven win team. I think it, re the reality of the situation is, as we would agree on, is this over under very much is on the shoulders of Jane Daniels. Like if Jane Daniels can really surprise and really have an, um, an impressive rookie season more than people expect, they could find a way to sneak out seven or eight. But I just think no matter what how you look at it, it's going to come down on his shoulders. There's just no other way. There's just no other way to put it because the run game is not going to be good enough by itself. The defense isn't going to be good enough by itself. It's going to come down to Jaden having to take over games. Moving into the AFC North, we have the Baltimore Ravens at 11 and a half wins with a strength of schedule at one of the hardest at 0.536. They open up the season against Kansas City, then Las Vegas playing Dallas, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Washington, Tampa Bay, Cleveland, Denver, Cincinnati again, Pittsburgh again, the Chargers, Philly, the Giants, Pittsburgh, Houston, Cleveland. Insanely hard. I don't know. Dobbs, what are you thinking? All right, I'm going to give you my exact thoughts on this one. And look, let me be clear. Ravens fans are going to be pretty sick at this. But again, I always just give my honest, you know, it's just I got to be real. Number one, I saw this morning that if I'm not mistaken, Lamar lost 20 pounds this offseason and slimmed down. OK, and we already know that, hey, look, Lamar bulked up essentially for the first time last season and he stayed healthy. Right. So and what was the problem with Lamar the years prior to this besides the MVP season was like, oh, like, you know, he's an amazing quarterback, but he just isn't out there every single week. And, you, you know, what? you want to see him out there more often. You want to see him getting injured less. I feel like there's a fair chance that him slimming back down, you know, all of a sudden he's missing a game here. He's missing a game there. Something sore, something got banged up or something could, you know what I mean? And, and losing 20 pounds, is a lot of weight. So if, if that happens and we go back to old Lamar, at, you know, past the prior prior to last season, but after the first MVP where there was that little, the two, three year stint where he's missing games. And on top of that, look, you have the target on your back. You won a bunch of games last year. You, you really should have made the Super Bowl. You, they, they really, as Ravens fans, you know, they really fumbled the AFC chip. I mean, the reality of the situation is target on your back. Lamar slimming down could potentially be very volatile. And on top of that, it's just really hard to repeat having two, an amazing season two years in a row. Do I think that they're going to be a 10, 11 win team? Absolutely. Can I do, do I think for sure, though, that they're going to get to 12, 13, 14 again? It's a lot to ask two years in a row. So with that being said, I'm going to say I'm going to go under on this one for all the reasons that I just listed. Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie to you. After looking at the schedule, like, I really do think they're an 11-win team. Like, I think 11 is a very good spot for them. I sh could see them getting to 12, but I don't think it's going to be another one of those 13, 14-win years. Um, you know, they have only gotten to 12 wins twice since 2018. And I just, with the way they're playing, kind of, if you're banking on Lamar not being healthy for all 17, and you kind of, you get Derrick Henry, though. Like, I think that takes kind of the load off him a little bit. I think maybe in the second year, you can gel with the offense a little bit more. I still think they had a good draft. But what really comes down to me is that it's not the Ravens themselves it's all their opponents that they're going to be playing. I find it very hard to believe that they're able to squeak out 12 wins with all the tough opponents that they have. So I'm going to get, no, I'm going to go wanna, under. 
I want to add this too on top of that because what you're saying is is spot on. And this is the thing too. I can already see the comments where Ravens fans are losing their mind. Ravens fans, let me be clear. Calm down. This does not mean that you're not still a Super Bowl contender, that you guys aren't still the same amazing team that we remember from last year. It's just regular season wins does not equate to who's going to win the Super Bowl. Look, the Chiefs have proved this multiple times now. The Patriots proved this many times in the past. You don't have to be the first seed and have the most wins to be the best team. That, that doesn't mean that you're the best team. It doesn't mean you're the worst. It doesn't mean anything until that you get to the playoffs. Are the Ravens still a playoff team? Absolutely. Can the Ravens still win the Super Bowl? Absolutely. Is it just, do we think that they're going to be a 12 plus win team again with the pressure on top of the fact that Lamar could potentially miss a game or two? No, that's just what it comes down to. Ravens fans don't overthink it. Moving into the Cincinnati Bengals. They have an over under of a 10 and a half wins with a strength of schedule of 5.02. They open up against New England and then they play at Kansas City, Washington, Carolina, Baltimore, the Giants, Cleveland, Philly, Las Vegas, Baltimore, the Chargers, Pittsburgh, Dallas, Tennessee, Cleveland, Denver, Pittsburgh. I am going to go over pretty easily here. They went 9 and 8 last year and they were playing with a ton of different quarterbacks so or wait not a ton right it was just jake browning right or am i tweaking i'm trying to i know it was jake browning for the majority if not the entire thing i'm trying to think back now but i know jake browning was the guy though that you know he was the guy where it was like okay this is this is the guy that's going to be like the backup now i'm trying to remember if i'm I'm pretty sure it was just jake browning to your point yeah i mean they added jermaine burton who is kind of a i'm trying to wild card yeah he's a wild card like he can be that guy who can step up for t higgins when he leaves but he's only going to have to be a wide receiver three they drafted eric all who i think doesn't need to perform right away they have chris jenkins um and then they drafted Marius mims who could sit there and develop so they have as kind of a safety plan at tackle to protect joe burrow and dobbs if i were to ask you a very simple question do you think that if the Bengals had Joe Burrow last year, that they would have been able to get to 11 wins. Do you think Joe Burrow elevates this team to two more wins? No, absolutely. But I will tell you, you know, from what I'm thinking right now, that's the only thing that's worrying me. I would be hammering over a thousand percent where again, you know me, I love Joe Burrow. Literally uh, that man, uh, the LSU connection always exists. Once you go to LSU, right? Like I'm always going to have love for the man, but it's starting to worry me now where when you've had so, so many injuries in such a short period of time, you know, you start to look at someone a little bit differently. And I start to look at Joe Burrow. I'm like, can he last out there for the whole season? But you know what? Since he's my guy, I'm going to make the assumption. Yeah. You know what? He's going to stay out there the whole season. They're going to find a way to protect him. And I'm going to ride with you. I'm going to ride the over on this one. Again, let me be clear. I'm, I'm skeptical because of, we know the injury history, but if he can stay healthy to your point, I do believe that he elevates them more than enough to be an 11 win team. So we're going to go on the basis that he's going to stay healthy, even though, Again, it's very possible that he doesn't. And if he doesn't, then all of a sudden, then this completely changes. But that's just kind of where it stands with the Bengals. I think everybody would agree with that at this point. The Bengals, much like we've said about a few other teams, like I was saying about the Commanders, this over and under rides very much on their quarterback. Like, there's just no other way to put it with the Bengals. Yeah, I think um, I, you were right. It, it was Jake Browning. A.J. McCarron played like he had four, five pass attempts. So, yeah, it was Jake Browning and Joe Burrow. Um Moving into the Cleveland Browns with an eight and a half and one of the hardest strength of schedules in the NFL. The Cleveland Browns play Dallas, Jacksonville, the Giants, the Raiders, Washington, Philly, Cincy, Baltimore, the Chargers get a bye. Then they have New Orleans, Pittsburgh, Denver, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, Cincinnati, Miami, and Baltimore. What are you thinking for the Cleveland Browns? Are they going to go over or are they going to go under? And I'm going to tell, all right, here, I, 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 for me, it's very simple in this case, where, again, they have Kevin Stefanski, and Kevin Stefanski has shown that he finds a way, you know, he just finds ways to grind out certain games, even games that the Browns shouldn't win, right? So, with that being said alone, and even if Deshaun can just be, like, slightly elevated from what we saw last year, I feel like this team is so talented and well-rounded that I just see them as a floor, like, nine-win team. So, yeah, I'm going to go over on this one, but... That, that schedule is scary, but I just feel like I can't discredit Stefanski at this point. He's shown he knows what he's doing very much. And yeah, with that being said, I- I'm riding on Stefanski on this one. I think Stefanski gets them to nine wins. Yeah, I'm also going to go with over here. And my reasoning is they actually won a playoff game with 
Joe Flacco at quarterback. And you could argue that Joe Flacco was playing – or no, they lost the wild card. They lost to the it, Texans. They lost to the but Texans. They made, yeah, but, yeah. They made they made a, but they it. made the run. I was lying. My bad. They made the run. They went 11-6, and six, right? And my thing is, you're telling me they can't get to nine wins? Like, you're telling me they can't get to nine win, wins with Sean Watson, who's supposed to be your franchise guy. Now, has he played that great? No, he's not. But at the end of the day, I think the Browns, like you were saying, are just so talented – on the defensive side of the ball and you know regardless of how you feel about Jerry Judy they do have a decent offense and they always have had a kind of decent offense with Stefanski so I think you know you may not be getting to 12 wins but I think nine is very obtainable no nine ten very obtainable for sure just they've, they've shown that at this point the Browns have it the pedigree at least in the regular season when Stefanski is there I'm not going to doubt him now all right, moving into the last team of the AFC North, we have the Pittsburgh Steelers at eight and a half. One of the hardest strength of schedules again. Pittsburgh plays at Atlanta, then Denver, Los Angeles Chargers, Indianapolis, Dallas, Las Vegas, the Jets, the Giants, Washington, Baltimore, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Cleveland again, Philly, Baltimore, Casey, and Cincinnati. Honestly, one of the most brutal gauntlets I have ever seen from week 11 on. And yeah, dude, even oh, when you my. play beforehand, like the Jets aren't a cakewalk. Dallas is not a cakewalk. Even Raiders not a cakewalk. defense, we don't know what to expect. That Raiders defense know. could be. We don't like, know. The Raiders offense could probably not be. It, it's not going to be horrible. I mean, like Aiden O'Connell's shown he, he can play a little bit. So, yes. Maybe, maybe this is the year where Mike Tomlin goes under 500. I think they will probably be eight and nine. Like, I think they'll win eight games. I, I don't know if they're going to get to nine looking at this schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and go under here. Yeah, you know what? It, it, you know what? Who would we be if we didn't if we didn't make the bold prediction together that this was the year that they go under 500? Because I'm with you. Like, look. We know Tomlin, we know the pedigree, we know the Steelers pedigree. And I, Steelers fans, let me be clear. Like, y'all totally could find a way to to laugh in our face again and find a way to pull out another, you know what I mean, nine, ten wins. It's just, it's, it's, it's in Mike Tomlin's <laughs> DNA at this point. But this roster and this schedule, I just, and especially because we certainly, certainly don't know what to expect from Russell Wilson or Justin Fields at this point. How the, how the hell that that's going to go? I feel like that we that's already another storybook that's waiting to be unfolded. It's, it's only a matter of time before that becomes a storyline, the way I see it. So I'm with you. All those things in, intertwined. Mike Tomlin could totally prove us wrong, but for right now, I'm going to stick with, again, what I know is that, that this roster is going to have a hell of a time trying to get nine wins. But Mike Tomlin, if they do, is going to be the reason. So that's think- really all there is to say on this one. I mean, you got to look at the receiving core, man. Like, George Pickens is not a certified one. Like, I think he can be a complementary piece to, a like, a dominant one, like maybe a 1B. But you put Pat Sertan on George Pickens. You put these top corners on George Pickens. You're praying Van Jefferson and Roman Wilson are creating all the separation. And, and Roman Wilson very well could be that good, but we know what Van Jefferson is. Well, and oh, oh, absolutely. I was saying, and let's just um, let's just say it like this too, because this is at least according to again, like I say, things are subject to, subject to change. But according to the depth chart right now, Steelers fans, you guys are going to be starting three rookies on the O line. And am I a fan of all three of them throughout the entire draft process? Absolutely. But we also know that O linemen usually don't come into their own and come into their their full potential that first year. We also definitely know that. So three rookies on that O line along with the inconsistencies of Russ and Justin as of recent. I mean, I just, if Mike, let's just say it like this. There's no other way to put it. If Mike Tomlin finds a way to get this team to a nine wins, I just round of applause. This, this, this would be his, this would be, this would be his, um, I can't even say that because last year, actually getting over 500 was probably his ultimate that, I mean, how, how did he do it last year? So he could totally do it again, but it's just, it gets harder and harder every year. And it's only a matter of time before it cracks, right? I don't know. Maybe not, though. I guess we're going to have to find out together. 
Moving into the NFC North, we have the Chicago Bears at eight and a half wins with one of the easiest strength of schedule at .467. Chicago opens up against Tennessee, then they got Houston, Indianapolis, the Rams, Carolina, Jacksonville, then a bye. Washington, Arizona, New England, Green Bay, Minnesota, Detroit, San Fran, Minnesota, Detroit, Seattle, Green Bay. So I don't know if they're going to be – I think they are liable to be a seven seed this year. Like I think that is kind of what their goal should be. And I think they can get to nine wins. So I'm going to go over eight and a half. They got to seven last year, and they much improved their team. They improved on their coaches as well. So give me the over for the Chicago Bears. I think it is probably one of the easier overs to me personally. I think adding two wins based off what they've added in the offseason makes a lot of sense. Yeah, like I'll be honest with you again, just because after what the Bears did to me last year, when I Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. I, just, I always don't want to get my hopes up too much. But again, you know, you know Bears fans know if they've been listening. How high am I on Caleb? It will not waver. And for that for that reason alone, along with a lot of the young, you know, you guys, I think, brought in good talent in the draft, albeit it was a lot of it. But I love everybody that you guys drafted. I think you guys made a lot of perfect moves on the coaching staff for what you guys are trying to do. So with all that combined, I am going to say, I do think it would be about the ceiling. Again, just no matter how good Caleb is, it's very hard. To, we, learning to win the NFL is not easy, right? Like, it's just, it's just not. Like, no matter how good Caleb is, it's not going to be this... Some Bears fans are over here like thinking that you guys are about to be a 13. No, it's, no. Just, it's just not. That's not how things work. It's just not. And if it is, and Caleb really is just that talented, well, then I'm just going to be doing backflips on camera because I, you know, <laughs> then, then I really just predicted it perfectly. But no matter how amazing he is this rookie year, I don't think that I see him getting past nine or 10 wins. But is it possible? Do I lean towards that possibility? Yeah. So I'm going to rock with you on this one, bro. And we're going to go over together on the Bears. I think this is the most fair thing to say about the Bears. If you want to be optimistic and think the team is a lot better than a nine win team, I would say the best way to look at the bears is they have a lot of young and new people on the team and they have time. They need time to develop while they may only win nine to 10 games. If they get rolling at the end of the season, like the Packers, I'm not saying they're going to go as far as the Packers went, but it is a reality of, okay, they can get hot at the right time. They are one of those teams that with a lower record could do better off in the playoffs than expected than what you would expect from like getting a 12 win rock. You know, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but no, I'm following what you're saying. So moving over to the Detroit lions, they have a over under of 10 and a half with a strength of schedule at 5.09. If we're looking at Detroit's schedule, they open up at Seattle, then they got Pittsburgh, Tampa Bay, the Jets, Las Vegas, the Chargers, New Orleans, Carolina, Baltimore, KC, Atlanta, Las Vegas, Cleveland. They get a bye in week 14. Indy, the Chargers, Cincinnati, and I just read Denver's schedule. My apologies. Detroit. Detroit opens I up against the Rams. I literally did the same thing at first. Bro, bro. Detroit opens up against the Rams, then they have Tampa Bay, Arizona, Seattle, then a bye. Dallas, Minnesota, Tennessee, Green Bay, Houston, Jacksonville, Indianapolis, Chicago, Green Bay, Buffalo, Chicago, San Francisco, Minnesota. What are you thinking here? I'm going to tell you this, and you let me know what you're thinking. I just think, especially after the way things ended last year, it's all that they've been thinking about is like, wow, we were literally like malpractice away from very potentially being the Super Bowl champions and bringing home that first Lombardi to Detroit. Like, I think they're going to be on a mission this year, especially with Dan Campbell leading the ship. Like, I see no way that they're not pissed off enough to go win 11 games as long as two things. The core of the team stays healthy, and B, Jared Goff doesn't get complacent that he's now the second richest quarterback in the league. But if those two things can align together and Jared Goff doesn't get complacent, again, I just see no way the Lions are not going to be pissed off enough to go win at least 11 games. Lions Nation, I'm, I'm on the restore the war train again, even though I guess it's been restored now. But <laughs> we're going, it's I'm going over on the yeah, it's been restored now. I'm going with the I'm rocking with the Lions, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to rock it that they can get to 11. Yeah, I'm going to go to 11 2, I, I, I think, or over 10 and a half. I think they can definitely get to 11 wins. And like you said, they improved their team this year. They didn't really lose any coaches. And 
they filled in where they need to fill in. So I, I don't know how much more explanation there is than they improved all over the field. They really should have been in the Super Bowl last year. And the Detroit Lions are going to be contenders year after year now. It's kind of weird to say, you know. It is very weird to say. And it's just like side note, because I, I've been thinking about this ever since the Jared Goff got the extension. Uh, what are they doing? Like, what's the plan with Hendon Hooker now? It's just off topic, but like, I, you know, I was just thinking about this the other day. Like, you know, that's just some something, something to monitor because, you know, just maybe someone's going to, I don't know, maybe Hendon Hooker is on another team sometime soon because that was, I know initially the plan was kind of like, well, if Jared Goff doesn't work out and then we'll have Hendon, you know, but all of a sudden, you know, Hen Hooker doesn't want to sit on the bench for another four or five years. I, that's just that's just what I was thinking recently, off topic, but something to monitor going forward as well. The last time the Lions had 12 wins outside of last year, 1991. That is Long wild. Long time ago. Yeah, was, the roar has been restored. Green Bay Packers over under 10 and a half. They have one of the hardest strengths of schedules. I promise I'll read the right one this time. They open up against Philly in a foreign country. Then you have Indy, Tennessee, Miami, or Minnesota, the Rams, Arizona, Houston, Jacksonville, Detroit. They get a bye. Then they play Chicago, San Fran, Miami, Detroit, Seattle, New Orleans, Minnesota, Chicago. Personally, I'm going to go over. I think the Packers did nothing but get better this offseason. Um, and as much as it pains me to say it, Jordan Love could potentially be that guy. So, again, I, I honestly think the NFC North is one of the most young and exciting divisions in football. If Jordan Love grows, their draft picks pan out, Matt LaFleur is Matt LaFleur. Like, I don't, I don't understand how they don't get to 11 wins this year. I don't know. And you, you basically took every single word out of my mouth. The only thing I even want to add to that, because you, you covered everything. The only thing I want to add is this. Like Jordan Love is has got has grown rapport with nothing besides at this point the same receiving core that he showed that he could gel with as young as they were last year, a whole nother offseason together. And on top of that, I just want to add, Jordan Love, if we if you're talking about guys to potentially throw a long shot bet on to win an MVP, right? Like I know we'll get to this video, this topic eventually. This would be a year where like if Jordan Love just balls ballistic and you look at the record and they're and they're top, like close to the top of the NFC and you look at the talent. In that on that team versus everyone else that has you know a potential MVP quarterback, this could really be a year Jordan Love could come and steal an MVP away. So I'm with you 100. I think I'm not again. It, this is just a pedigree more than anything. Like we know the Packers, we know the pedigree, we know the Flores pedigree. Yeah, I, I think I would be foolish not to say that I'd lean that they're going to be an 11 win plus team. Like, but I could also very well see them being in that nine ten range and having to kind of get hot towards the end of the year again. But I'm with you that I think it's going to be an ascension versus a stagnation. As much as you say that, and I hate it, I can see it 100%. I could definitely see Jordan Love winning an MVP next year. Moving into the Minnesota Vikings, we have a six and a half for the over and under with a .502 strength of schedule. Minnesota opens up against the Giants. Then they have San Fran, Houston, Green Bay, the Jets, a bye. Then they have Detroit, the Rams, Indy, Jacksonville, Tennessee, Chicago, Arizona, Atlanta, Chicago, Seattle, Green Bay, Detroit. Ooh, we that is, in my opinion, a lot tougher than the strength of schedule makes it seem. And at first, when I was eyeing that six and a half, I was like, nah, nah, they're definitely going to get seven. After looking at who they play, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm going to go under here. See, this is one where it's like, I'm with you, where it's like, but you know what, though? It's kind of like with the Giants. It's like when I was like, it's hard to go against what, with Dable because he's shown he has the stuff. But even when your coach has the stuff, if the roster doesn't have the stuff, it, sometimes you can only work with so much. And if, again, because I've been hearing reports now, that they have a plan for McCarthy to start the beginning of the year if everything goes perfect. But if and that, and that scares the shit out of me as somebody that's been truthing JJ McCarthy, because as I've said, I don't really care what the fuck the plan is. I don't think throwing him in this year should be a part of the plan at all. I'll be on record saying it. I've been on record saying it. If he gets thrown into the fire, I think there's even a lower chance that they get over seven. But if it's Sam Darnold, we know we have it Sam Darnold. It's kind of the same concept where it's like, I don't, is Sam Darnold gonna get these this crew? You know, like, and that's a really tough schedule 
yeah, could Kevin O'Connell find a way to get these boys over seven, the, the seven win, you know, around that hump for sure. But I'm going to logically lean with you that, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to stick with what I know. What I know is that it's going to be really tough for them to win seven games with that schedule and with the quarterback situation. All right, moving into the AFC South, we have the Houston Texans with nine and a half over under wins. 0.526 strength of schedule. And Houston opens up against Indianapolis. Then they got Chicago, Minnesota, Jacksonville, Buffalo, New England, Green Bay, Indianapolis, New York Jets, Detroit, Dallas, Tennessee, Jacksonville, Miami, KC, Baltimore, Tennessee. What are you thinking, Dobbs? Dude, I'm going to say I'm not doubting CJ Stroud after last year. Like, this is one of those situations where it's like, that team rallies behind him. Like that 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 team rallies behind D'Amico and CJ. They have you can just talk for last year. That that team really developed a culture in that first year. They added so many pieces. I don't care what the strength of that schedule says. I think they're finding a way to get to 10 wins. Give me over on this one easily. I don't care what that strength schedule says. Easily for me. Yeah, I mean, if you add all you added in the draft and free agency and you don't get to 10 wins in my opinion that's kind of a failed season i mean i know yeah. oh, the absolutely. regular season doesn't necessarily determine everything um they had 10 wins last year and they greatly improved the roster yes their schedule is harder but the texans are one of those teams that i don't really care who they play i'm not going to count them out so i why did they put up 40 plus on one of the best defenses in the league in the playoffs it's like you can't yeah. you can't come off of that season and then regress or at least you can't do it and then feel good about the future. So if they're on the trajectory that we think that they are, there's just no way, right? No. So I'm going to go over for the Houston Texans. Looking at the Indianapolis Colts, we have an over under of eight and a half games with a strength of schedule of four, nine, one. Indy opens up against Houston. They have Green Bay, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Jacksonville, Tennessee, Miami, Houston, Minnesota, Buffalo, Jets, Detroit, New England, Denver, Tennessee, Giants, Jacks. See, I really do think they can win nine games, but they're one of those teams to me that I just question. I, I don't know if they can. I, I I think they could beat Green Bay. I don't know, though. I think they could beat Jacksonville. I don't know, though. And it's like those, to me, are the determining factors. And I even see Tennessee maybe being a hard game for them because of the division rival. So I think I like them at nine games. I think I do. So I think I am going to lean over here. I was thinking the exact same thing where it's like, again, even if, even if, and Colts fans are going to hate to hear this. I, I hate to hear this too, but I only, we only speak hypotheticals. Only, I, like, it's only stuff that could be objectively true. And what, if, if Anthony Richardson has a bad year and, and things fall off the rails, look, Joe Flacco's sitting right there, and we saw what Joe Flacco did last year for the Browns, right? I mean, it's like, I, I'm looking at it like that, where it's like with Gardner Minshew, they already were, right? They were like, they were this team that, that already is over this hump. I feel like it's like, I, how could I say that that they're not going to, you know what I mean? It's kind of like that same situation. Head coach only getting closer with the team. The scheme is only getting driven in more. You have another whole off season together. I think that, yeah, even though it's not going to be, I don't think too much of an improvement over last year, and it could be very similar and just, you know, I think, I think they get to nine wins though. And again, this is one where I'm so 50, 50. This is one of the toughest ones by far. They totally could end up falling under this threshold, but you know what? We were a, we were, we've been a Richie, tr a Richie truthers. That's a, that's a tongue twister. We've been a Richie truthers since day one. We can't fold on him now. No. So now we're into one of the interesting teams. And as I look at our predictions, we've been going over quite a bit. And I, I so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I guess I'm not, we're not too much. We, we, we're similar in over and unders. It just we've on, been on a high string of over. So I was trying to think, like, looking at these teams, like, it's hard to really – you want to be optimistic. But this is one of those teams where I just don't know. Jacksonville Jaguars with 8.5, 0.512 strength of schedule. Jacksonville plays Miami, Cleveland, Buffalo, Houston, Indianapolis, Chicago, New England, 
Green Bay, Philly, Minnesota, Detroit, Houston, Tennessee, the Jets, Vegas, Tennessee, Indianapolis. I'm going to go – as much as I hate it, I'm going to go under here. I think that that – all their opponents are really hard. And while I do think the offense will look better, if Doug Peterson does come in and start calling plays, I just think this might be too much to overcome to get to nine wins. See, I, I'm going to go over on this one just because – I ha- I still have faith. In- I have faith. Trevor Lawrence is going to carry this team to like to to at least nine wins. But I'm with you. Like this was this is not an easy one either, especially with that strength of schedule. I just think, especially after how disappointing last year was, there's going to be that motivation, especially for Doug Peterson to have to find a way to at least be a playoff team. So with that said, I am going to take the over on this one. All right, moving into the last team of the AFC South, we have the Tennessee Titans with over under six and a half wins with the strength of schedule of 0.491. The Titans open up against Chicago. Then they play the Jets, Green Bay, Miami. Then they have a bye. Indy, Buffalo, Detroit, New England, the Chargers, Minnesota, Houston, Washington, Jacksonville, Cincy, Indianapolis, Jacksonville, and Houston again. So to get to seven wins, they're realistically going to have to beat Chicago, Indy, New England, the Chargers, Minnesota, Washington, and then Jacks or Indy again. I think I'm going under. I think they're a six win team. I, I is I don't know though. I, I really wanna I really wanna pick over though. Like I think they could really easily get to seven, but I don't see them sweeping anybody in their division, you know? And I think that's where the wins, some of the wins need to come from. Yeah, you know what? And again, I, I, look, I'm going to go under, but Titans fans, let me be completely clear. That's just because of what I know right now, where I, I, if Will Levis makes a humongous jump next year, there is no doubt that they could end up actually shattering this total and being one of those really surprising teams. So I want to be clear, Titans fans. Like, this is no slight... It's just it's just what I know now, and it's just like because I can't put my stock into someone that hasn't shown that they're gonna that they've made that jump. Like yes, Will Levis showed us flashes. Will Levis has showed us good stuff. But I want to remind people we've seen other quarterbacks have those flashes and then it just never pans out. Like like Will Levis would not be the first and would not be the last to be able to really surprise you initially and then never make it work all the way and really make it round out again. Do I want to believe that he that he can be that guy for you guys? Absolutely. But I just can't go with all in yet because it's still minimal sample size. But again, he could come out this year and very much be a surprise. And you guys could be one of the, the surprise teams this year. But with what I know right now, I'm going to go under on the Titans right here. Moving in to the NFC South, we have the Atlanta Falcons at nine and a half over under win totals with a strength of schedule of 4.53. One of the easiest in the NFL Atlanta plays Pittsburgh, Fidley, KC. So tough start with three games. Then they move on to New Orleans, Tampa Bay, Carolina, Seattle, Tampa Bay, Dallas, New Orleans, Denver. Then they have a bye. The Chargers, Minnesota, the Las Vegas, the Giants, Washington, Carolina. I think that is a pretty safe over. I think 10 wins should be really where they're aiming, especially with Kirk Cousins. And they've won 7-10, and 10, I believe, the last three seasons if they're not able to get to 10 wins with the added talent from the draft unfortunately they didn't really add one in the first round that is going to help them right now but that's been beaten it's a dead horse I don't know I just feel like if they don't get to 10 wins the season's kind of a disappointment oh if they if they don't if they don't find a way to get to the playoffs somebody if not multiple people are getting fired and all of a sudden we're in a really weird situation in Atlanta but I'm with you look I think that I see them getting to 10 wins. I could see them getting to 11. I see them somewhere right in that range, especially with how weak the NFC South is. You know, you've made all these changes. You added a lot of, you know, you added a lot of talent. If you can't find a way to get to 10 wins, somebody's got to get fired. That's just really the only way you can look at this. I know Falcons fans would agree. So that's really all there is to it if you're the Falcons at this point. You made way too many adjustments and changes to not be a 10-11 win team in this desperately... I don't want to say talent barren, but it's just a shit shoot right now. The NFC South with the Falcons with the talent the Falcons have, 
They should be able to win it. I can see them potentially, you know, again, I, I could see the, Sa- the Saints giving them some trouble. I could see the Bucks giving them some trouble. But all in all, the Falcons look like they have the roster that's kind of, it's not, it's, it's close, but they're definitely the one above the rest in the NFC South. If they can't find a way to make it happen this year, 10 wins, well, changes have got to be made. And, and it, oh, even though you just made a bunch of changes, there's no more, there's no more time for the Falcons to kind of, right? Falcons fans would agree with that and they would definitely echo the sentiment. Moving into the Carolina Panthers, over under four and a half wins, strength of schedule, four, five, three. They play New Orleans, the Chargers, Las Vegas, Cincinnati, Chicago, Atlanta, Washington, Denver, New Orleans, again, the Giants. Then they get a bye. KC, Tampa Bay, Philly, Dallas, Arizona, Tampa Bay, Atlanta. I am going to go under. I don't think they get to five wins this year. As much as I like Bryce Young, and I didn't mind their offseason, didn't really love their draft, didn't love everything they did on the offseason, and I still don't think Bryce Young is in a great position to succeed. I do think their O-line play will be better. I think their offense will be better because of Dave Canales. I just, I don't, I think the Panthers to me are one of the worst drafting teams in the NFL and those decisions and draft picks, you know, linger in terms of how bad your team is. Obviously you have them under contract. So I, I don't know if I love the idea of adding like to a room with a Deontay Johnson and Adam Thielen. I just don't know if that was the right pick. See, I, you got me thinking and it's like, I, I just feel like even though I can like Panthers fans, let me be clear. I'm, I'm switching. I, I initially was going to go over, but I'm going to go under Panthers fans. Let me be clear. Like, it's it, especially because too like you know there's only a fair amount of teams that could be over there's only a fair amount of teams that could be under logically and if we're looking at in terms of roster construction like yeah the it, it, let me be clear like if bryce makes a big jump this year they, they very well could be six seven eight, even pretend maybe eight win team like they, if bryce makes a big jump you know they could the, the ceiling of this team goes up a lot which is obviously what they're banking on right a lot of new young talent added to the offense in terms of the o-line and then jonathan brooks but just all in all even with an easier schedule, it's just when the first year head coach, did they have the juice to get over the hump of the five wins? I just, I see them getting right around. It's either going to be four or five. I feel like the way I see it, but again, just in terms of statistics, I'm going to lean on the opposite side of that where I think they'll finish right around four. But again, I want to be clear. This is one of those ones where if there's a team that could kind of shatter their total and really be like, Oh yeah, you doubted us. Like, yeah, yeah. Ha ha. That, that really actually could be the Panthers this year because if Dave Canales comes in and gets the culture right and things really get moving well, again, like I said, I can see them seeing seven, eight-win team and, you know, all of a sudden, Panthers are really building for the future. But we're just going off what we know now. What I know now, I got to have them as under, just like you said. Moving into the New Orleans Saints, seven and a half wins over under. 4.67 or 4.467 strength of schedule. They open up against Carolina. Then they have Dallas, Philly, Atlanta, KC, Tampa Bay, Denver, the Chargers, Carolina, Atlanta, Cleveland, then a bye, the Rams, the Giants, Washington, Green Bay, LV, Tampa. I Dobbs, I'll let you go first on this one. See, here's my thing. Derek Carr did finish the season as one of the hottest quarterbacks in the league. We brought Clint Kubiak in. I'm much higher on our receiving core than a lot of people even though it's definitely still far from being well, like complete, let me be clear, you know, but I am, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in on Shahid and I'm in on Olave. I'm in on the fact that a lot of people, you know, still are not very big on it, but I think Kendra Miller is going to actually be getting a fair amount of snaps this year. He looked really good towards the end of the year when he was starting to get reps. If we can find a way to make him and Kamara kind of a power combo. And if that defense can play how it was towards the beginning of the season. And it is the problem though. The saints as a saints fan, I tell you know, I tell everybody all the time. There's just no consistency. The Saints show up and look like the best team in league against one of the best teams. But then when they play one of the worst teams, they look even worse than one of the worst teams in the league. The Saints have, they've had no consistency during the Dennis Allen era. And that's kind of the problem is when there's no consistency, we don't know what to expect. But I tell you this, as a Saints fan, I do expect them to win at least, at least, but not more than either much really. It's kind of like an eight to 10 win range. But I don't see them winning less than eight. I think it'll be right in that 8 to 10 range. Nothing more, nothing less. So with that said, I'm going to go over on this team. I have the Saints at a 7 to 9 win range. And when I look at the schedule, I just don't have... I will say this. I have confidence in them getting 7. 
I don't have confidence in them getting eight. Not saying they can't do it, but it's just like looking at it. I think they could swing a couple division games their way, and I think that's how they get over that seven and a half hump. So obviously division games are a lot more important based on you know your record in the division when you want to make the playoffs. And I think, yes, your team may not be – I'm not, not speaking for the Saints in general, just speaking in – just speaking across the NFL. You may be a worse team than your division opponent, but because of the height of importance of these division games, you're more likely to swing them. So this is one of the lines that is probably – this, this is probably the hardest line for me outside of – what one was I talking about earlier that was super tough? The Commanders. Um, was it- the Commanders. Just very weird. I don't know how to feel about it. No, I'm with you. As a Saints fan, I don't know how to feel about it either. How about this? It's I, I win either way. Because if we go under this, Dennis Allen has his can. <laughs> and if we go over this, we should be a wild card team. And maybe they finally actually started getting some consistency in the Clint Kubiak offense. I'm wishful thinking. Uh, who knows what the hell the Saints future really looks like. But, yeah, I'll stick with my guns on this one, though. I think we can find a way to get to eight wins. Finishing up the NFC South with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at 8.5 over under win total. .478 strength of schedule. Tampa Bay opens up against Washington. Then they have Detroit, Denver, Philly, Atlanta, New Orleans, Baltimore, Atlanta, KC, San Francisco, the Giants, Carolina, Vegas, the Chargers, Dallas, Carolina, New Orleans. Ooh, this is tough. This is tough because they start out really, really tough outside of the Washington game and the Denver game. I do think they can get the nine wins, but I really do think it's going to be hard. And I also think there is a chance that they regress a little bit from last year. I think the Bucs are a very, very solid team overall, but I do believe that they overperformed a little bit. So I'm going to go under i think i'm gonna go under just because and look i can already hear the comments like you know how could you go how could you go over the, look the saints have a whole game difference over the bucks and i think that the bucks and saints like i said are going to finish very much in that same very similar range but to your to your point like you're already saying look the thing that i think about with the bucks it, here's where the vo- areas of volatility potentially come in baker is now comfortable again like we saw baker fighting for his life versus baker comfortable We've seen, yes, albeit was an injured Baker when he wasn't fighting for his life in that contract anymore. But like Baker comfortable versus Baker fighting for his for fighting for his money, fighting for his career. Two different Bakers, right? So now that Baker's back in that more comfortable range, does that have an effect on this offense? Number one, it's a question we have to wait to see answered, right? And you know, like we were talking about um, with Mr. Bucks, like you're in a situation where Todd Bowles not it's it, the, the fan base was split. Like it was Todd Bowles the guy. Was that run the reason he's even still here? How much is this team all the way bought in on what he's doing? There's a lot of questions on the interior of the O-line, especially if Graham Barton doesn't come in and have the work here that we expect. If Graham Barton comes in and struggles, and this in the interior plays how they played last year, again, you're struggling at three of the five positions. Now, that's just hypothetical. But And then also, you have a lot of young guys on defense that are still unproven, a lot of them. So when you pile all that together, I just feel like, yeah, I'm going to say, like, again, they could they totally end up getting over it and being that team that wins the division and surprises us just like last year? Oh, they absolutely could. But I'm just going to go under just off the assumptions of everything I just said. I think the NFC South has the easiest strength of schedule by far of any division in the NFL. Oh, that's what I noticed right away. Oh, they definitely do. Moving into the AFC West, we have the Denver Broncos with an over-under win total of 5.5 and, and a strength of schedule of .495. Denver opens up at Seattle. Then they play Pittsburgh, Tampa Bay, the Jets, Las Vegas, the Chargers, the Saints, Carolina, Baltimore, KC, Atlanta, Las Vegas, Cleveland, Indianapolis, the Chargers, Cincinnati, and KC. I think this team gets to six wins this year. I just, because of the coaching pedigree, bringing in Bo Nix, I think he's going to be better right away than a lot of people think. And while this roster still needs a lot of work, I think Sean Payton sets the floor pretty high in terms of how much he can raise it. And Denver won eight games last year. 
Oh, yeah, no. Let me be clear. Sean Payton won, if I'm not mistaken, eight games with uh, Taysom Hill and Trevor Simeon. Broncos fans, fret not. He's going to find a way to get you guys to six wins this year. And again, I don't know who it's going to come against. I don't know when it's going to come. That, that's kind of the thing with Sean Payton and and just the, the Broncos even under in, recently in, in general. It's like they kind of win some games where you're kind of like, what? Like they won that game? Like I feel like this that's just with this coaching staff right now, it's just the Broncos. I don't see them winning. Again, I could it very well could be just six wins. It very well could be just six. But I don't see them, like, to your point, I don't see them going under six. I think that they very much fall within a six to eight win range. And I kind of just see it like rigidly like that. So moving in to the Kansas City Chiefs, as I correct the Oakland Raiders to the Las Vegas Raiders, they have an over and under win total for the Chiefs at 11 and a half and the strength of schedule at .502. KC opens up against Baltimore, then they have Cincy, Atlanta, the Chargers, New Orleans, and they have a bye. San Fran, Las Vegas, Tampa Bay, Denver, Buffalo, Carolina, Las Vegas, the Chargers, Cleveland, Houston, Pittsburgh, and Denver. Give me the over. I think they're winning 12 games this year. See, I feel like it's just weird, though, because I can, like, very much see them getting, like, right to 10 or 11, and then it's like they still win the Super Bowl. Like, this is just like I was saying about the Ravens. Like, I'm going to – look, I'm going to go under on this, especially because also, you know, a little underrated, but, like, look, you know, Rasheed Rice is supposed to miss a, a majority of the season if that if that ever ends up coming to fruition, which it probably will. And then on top of that, look, we know Travis Kelsey's the man, but he's getting older. And a lot of younger, unproven guys in the receiving core outside of that. And yes, look, do we expect a lot from them? Yeah, we do. But if they don't end up panning out, especially this, you know, first year, I think, it, you know what? Like, it's very realistic that the Chiefs could be a 10-11 win team and still go win the Super Bowl. And again, on top of that, you have that target on your back. You're already the repeat champs. Everybody's going to give you their best every single week. With that said, I'm going to go under on this. But just like I said about the Ravens, don't come at me, Chiefs fans. You guys still very much can win the Super Bowl. You very much are still my favorite to win the Super Bowl. Regular season win totals don't mean you're going to win or lose the Super Bowl. Just, yeah. So with that being said, it's a tough strength of schedule. Give me under on the Chiefs, but they're still going to be that team. I'll say this. I honestly believe this is going to be one of the better Chiefs seasons we've seen. I'm very confident going into the year to and seeing what they can do. I do have concerns at left tackle, but I think their offense is better. I think their defense is going to be just as good and I don't know I just am very I feel very very good about the Chiefs going into this year moving on to the Las Vegas Raiders they have an over under win total of six and a half with a 0.512 strength of schedule definitely pretty hard um, they have the Chargers the Ravens Carolina Cleveland Denver Pittsburgh the Rams KC Cincy Miami, Denver, again, KC, Tampa Bay, Atlanta, Jacks, New Orleans, Chargers. I'm, I'm going to go under. I, I don't know how that – I think they can get to seven games. I think they can get to eight games. Aiden O'Connell is your quarterback. Gardner Minshew is your quarterback. You add Brock Bowers. You add Jackson Powers Johnson. You know, I am optimistic for Antonio Pierce, but I need to see a full season of it. See, okay, you know what? I'm going to – I'm going to go opposite of you here again, but I'm but not by much. Like, let me be clear. I think, just kind of like I said about the Broncos, I think I view the Raiders, like, very rigidly, like, anywhere from, like, a... Again, like, they could they could go under this. Like, let me be clear. I could be... They could, they could go under. I see them very rigidly as, like, a six-win team to, like, a nine-win team where, like, the nine is their ceiling, the six is the floor. But again, just on, on, on statistics alone, then, with if I view that that's the range, I'm going to go over. I think they're going to fight for AP... I think that this defense is going to play very well this whole season as they did last year, especially with the additions that, you know, that have been made, the, the guys that have been in the system now for a whole two years. I'm going to go over, but not by a lot. Like, I think they're going to be a 7-8 win team pretty rigidly. If they got to 9, I'd be surprised. But I'm going to say over on this one just, just because I think this team is going to play very hard for AP. Last team in the AFC West. We have the Los Angeles Chargers with an over and under of 8.5. With a 4-7-8 strength of schedule, the Chargers open up against Las Vegas, and they have Carolina, Pittsburgh, KC, Denver, Arizona, New Orleans, Cleveland, Tennessee, Cincinnati, Baltimore, Atlanta, KC, Tampa Bay, Denver, New England, Las Vegas. 
I am going to go under here. I think they are an eight-win team, and I just think while I did love the Joe Alt pick, I think they're about a year away from being truly what Harbaugh and Horitz want at, from a roster standpoint. Obviously, they um, you know, are struggling a little bit at the wide receiver position, and the running back room is just okay. I think they have to retool the offensive line a little bit on the interior. So I do think they get to eight wins this year, but I do think they can be a candidate for 10-11 next year. Yeah, I think they're one of these teams that ranges really far, though. Like, and what I mean by that is like, look, like with with Harbaugh coming in, it's it's like we know like that that culture change can happen like really quick. And I and I could see them like really surprising a lot of people being like a 10, 11 win team. And we're like, oh, OK, like they're they're about business already. Like it's like there was no transition period. They're right into business. But I'm with you. Let me be clear. I'm with you that. I view them much like a seven, eight win team this year where they're good. Let me be clear, because I can already see the comments for them too. Like I've already seen them on the previous videos. Uh, we talked about Chargers recently. Like you guys expect the team to be good immediately. I get it as you should, right? Like the Chargers have had a good roster for a while or at least an above average one where the results haven't met that. But it just takes time when there's a new staff. It takes time when there's a whole new system in place. It, it's just, I just don't see them getting over that initial hump right this year, but I can see them again. If they have a surprise year, wouldn't surprise me I'm leaning on what I know. I'm leaning that they're going to go under. They very well are on that surprise candidate list, though, where they could shatter this and have a ha-ha moment, you know? Moving into our last division, we have the NFC West. The Arizona Cardinals with an over-under of six and a half wins. Four, eight, eight strength of schedule. They open up against Buffalo, Los Angeles, Rams, Detroit, so tough three games. Then they have Washington and then San Fran and Green Bay. Oh, Lord. The Chargers, Miami, Chicago, the Jets, Seattle, Minnesota, Seattle, New England, Carolina, the Rams. This is a lot harder than that strength of schedule is making it seem. I think I'm going to go. I think I'm going to go under. I think they're a six win team this year. I don't I don't know. I really do want to go over, but the wins I see are Washington, the Chargers, Maybe Miami, Seattle, maybe Chicago, New England, Carolina. Yeah, I'm going to go over, actually. I, that was yeah, eight. No, I'm with you. I'm I'm going over. I think, you know what? I think another year of Gannon, again, right? Like, the, the, I think this defense is going to really start coming together. I think with Kyler back healthy, whole off season, adding Marv, they're, they're, they're a very wild card team in terms of expectations. They could floor out at, like, five wins and have everybody like oh shit like gannon's out working, yeah. restart or they could be like if a 10 11 win team where we're all like oh like just like i said about the chargers like whoa okay like they're right back in like they're not there's not much of a retool period like they're right back in business i feel like they are one of the most volatile teams in terms of expectations but again just leaning leaning where i feel more where i'm leaning more i think they could very easily get to seven eight even nine but I think that that's just how I view it. Seven to nine is kind of that range for me. I'd have to agree with you. I think they are a very big sleeper this year. And I do like their offense. I feel like a lot more than other people. I would have to agree with you that they are probably one of my most volatile teams in terms of where their record could end up. Moving into the Los Angeles Rams, we have an over-under of 8.5 with a strength of schedule of .505. The Rams open up against Detroit, and then they have Arizona, San Francisco, Chicago, Green Bay, then a bye, Las Vegas, Minnesota, Seattle, Miami, New England, Philly, New Orleans, Buffalo, San Fran, the Jets, Arizona, and Seattle. Um, what are you thinking, Dobbs? I'm thinking, look, I'm not going to doubt Stafford and McVay. Like, I just, I'm going to keep it simple. Like, I think that they've shown if staff is healthy, that's, that's, how about that? that? That's the contingency. If staff stays healthy the whole season, this is a playoff team again. And so with that said, I'm going to go over. But if staff gets injured again, I th and I think that's really all that this line is banking on. If you're, if you're creating this line, you're like, yeah, staff's getting older and he's had injuries in the past where it was the, the whole arthritis thing that never really kind of came fully to fruition, but it's got to be in the back of your head somewhere if you're thinking about this. I think if you're writing this line, all you were thinking about is like, is, if staff stays healthy the whole season, that's the question, right? Like that's really all there is to it. If you know, it's like if he stays healthy the majority of the season, plays most of the games, they're a playoff team again. But then also, like we said, look, losing Aaron Donald is no easy replacement. 
But I think they've done about just as much as you can do to have that D line still be a productive unit while losing him. It banks a lot on the young guys, but it banks much more on staff than anything else. Because no matter how you slice it, AD was not that he wasn't still one of the best D linemen in the entire league last year. Oh, Lord knows he was. But you can say you finally started to see the regression a little bit in terms of explosiveness. So it's not like they're losing him in his absolute prime where it's like, okay, this is going to completely change everything. Yeah, it changes a lot. But I still think this is a playoff team, even with the loss of Aaron Donald. I am going to go over as well. They won 10 games last year. I think they drastically improved um, in the secondary. They added so many units to the offense or um, to the defensive line. They signed a guard. I mean, I, I just think, like you said, you can't doubt Stafford or McVay. This is a team that I could see winning 10 games again. I, I don't. I think eight and a half is a little low. I think those are one of the lines that I will probably be hammering. I think adding a game to that would have been a lot better. Um, but at the end of the day, I do think the Rams, year in and year out, if Stafford is healthy, are Super Bowl contenders just because of the fact of the pedigree that the quarterback and coach have. San Francisco 49ers, 11 and a half wins at a .505 strength of schedule. They open up against the Jets. Then they have Minnesota, the Rams, New England, Arizona, Seattle, KC, Dallas, Then they have a bye. Tampa Bay, Seattle, Green Bay, Buffalo, Chicago, the Rams, Miami, Detroit, Arizona. Give me the over. Um, I don't, from year to year, it's so funny to me because I don't necessarily think the 49ers ever get better because I think they're already one of the best teams in the NFL. But it seems to me like they almost never, ever get worse. And, you know, the only way I see the 49ers not winning 12 games this year or more is if they have a quarterback issue. If Brock Purdy gets hurt, if he regresses a lot, that's the only way I don't see them winning 12 games. Um, you know, in the last, since 2019, they've won 12 games. That's the last five seasons. They've won 12 games, three out of the five years. And then one of the years they had 10 wins. So, I think it's pretty safe to say that the 49ers can win 12 or more games this year. Yeah, like I'm with you 100%. This is the one team that I think I've picked where like they had a really good season last year where I'm actually going to pick them to get over this total again. But it's for all the reasons you said. And on top of that, they rely the least on their pass game and they have the best running back in the league. They have a, a... they have two other, they're two backup, th- th- all three of their backups are guys that could produce in the league. I mean, expect, I, we don't even know what to expect from Isaac Garendo, but you had a 4-3 back to this offense. Like, you have so many guys that can run the ball efficiently. You have a fantastic O-line. You you made you made great additions, right? Like, adding Devondre Campbell to this defense, now you're getting Hufanga back for a whole season while the Jair Brown stepped into his spot and played fantastic ball for a rookie. Like, this is a roster that, and you, again, one of my guys that no one talks about, but you add Isaac Yadam to this DB room, real ones know. The 49ers definitely did get significantly better from a roster that was already really, really good that was this close to winning the Lombardi. How can I not, with that, with all those things being said, how can I not take the Niners to, yeah, I'm going to say that they're going to get to a floor of 12, albeit I can see them getting right to 11 and barely not making it. And yeah, that's very, is that possible? Yes. But like I've been saying the whole time, I'm looking in terms of statistics, that's a minor side of the statistic. The more that I view. So yeah, I'm taking my 75% that they get over and I'm happy with it. Moving on to our last team. We have the Seattle Seahawks. They have a over under of seven and a half wins and a four, eight, eight strength of schedule. They open up against Denver. Then they have new England, Miami, Detroit, The Giants, San Fran, Atlanta, Buffalo, the Rams, San Fran again, Arizona, the Jets, Arizona again, Green Bay, Minnesota, Chicago, the Rams. What are you thinking, Dobbs? This one is so tough. It's so tough. Because it's like, I don't feel like it's like they regressed enough for me to, this is so tough. Like this, this to me is the toughest one I think to pick today. Because there's multiple contingencies. Like, even if Geno doesn't start the season good and it's like, panic button, Sam Howell gets thrown in. We saw, like, Sam Howell, like, again, he, I think he got the blame. He was the, he was the, what's the, how am I blanking on this? He was the, what do they say? Scapegoat? Yeah, he was the scapegoat, right? Like, it was so, the writing was on the wall. Like, 
everybody knew already that everyone else in Washington was going to lose their job, but they tried to they tried to say no. It's the young and it's Sam. You know, we got to <laughs> ship them out. Where I don't know really. Well, like we've talked about, I don't really like that. That was kind of a weird situation how that happened, right? So you're in a situation now where it's like even if they start the season off rough, Sam Howell, he man, talk about a good backup to have in the room. He could come in there and shock everyone and and, and get to produce him like how he was at the beginning of the year last year. And all of a sudden, the Seahawks offense is kind of I don't want to say explosive, but it's it's improved and it's like I, they they are what are you thinking because i'm honestly stuck i really am, i really am stuck on what i think about the seahawks right now honestly i feel like i'm a lot lower on them than a lot of people i'm gonna go under because of the fact that i think they lost a lot of pieces um you know their draft wasn't the worst thing in the world but i also just it's a it's a rookie head coach right he's gonna be working with pieces that not are not all necessarily his and I do like their secondary I feel like but they improved you know with Byron Murphy on the defensive line you have Christian Haynes but okay I don't I just don't feel like after losing Shane Waldron that Gino is going to be able to repeat the last two years that he's had so I just don't see them winning eight games this year I think this is probably a regression season yeah, I think, and I, you you could also say like there are so many questions on the O line, like it, like Charles Cross got a little bit better from that first year, but like outside of that, you can say Abraham Lucas, especially with the injuries, it's like now all of a sudden there's questions at the right tackle spot. Anthony Bradford, rough rookie year. There's already questions. And again, you got to give these guys time. I'm aware, but center position, a lot of questions. Right. Like in Tomlinson, he's had a good career, but he's getting to the end of it and didn't have a good season last year. So many questions on the O-line. I love adding Byron Murphy. I think the defensive trenches I'm confident in. But to your point, if this if this team is going to win a lot of games, I think they're going to have to bank very much on that young defense. And this young defense has shown that it can step up. But I just don't know if it's going to be able to step up enough to to supplement all the things that you've already addressed where there's so many new things on this team. Yeah, you know what? I'm with you. I, I've already not been high on the Seahawks where I think it's going to be a regression season. And I'm, everything you said to convince me just solidified it. I'm with you on this one. We're going to go under on it, even though this was the hardest choice I had to make today, Seahawks fans. I'm sorry if you guys end up shattering it. And you know what? Surprising everybody again. Round of applause. You know, it's no hate here, but I just got to go with what I know. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. This has been over and under predictions for all 32 NFL teams. If, As always, if you don't know ball and want to know ball, oh, I'm going to restart that. As always, if you don't know ball and want to know ball, be sure to subscribe, leave a like, let us know in the comments what record prediction you think we were the most wrong on. We will be back next week with some more content for you. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your night.